We're kicking off this new year, and our theme for the whole year is Raise a Hallelujah, to, to lift up a praise to God. And this book, Psalms, and if, if, you're, if you're open to, to Psalms, if you found Psalm 105, um, this book of Psalms has 150 songs, and many of them are, are psalms of praise. Many of them are actually, the whole focus is praising God, glorifying God, lifting up the name of God. So all year long, we're going to focus every night of worship on this one concept. How do we praise and worship and glorify God with greater commitment, with greater passion, with, with, with greater hunger for the heart of God? How do we grow as those who love to praise the living God? And, and I know for some of you, you might say, well, you know, I'm in a season right now where there's been loss in my life, there's pain in my life, there's, there's health issues. You know, you're online right now because you can't go out, because you can't get out of bed, and you're saying, how do I praise God in, you know, in, in the valley? How do I praise God in the pit of life? But I love in the book of Acts, when the apostle Paul and his companions, when Paul has been beaten for preaching the gospel and shackled and thrown in jail, in the middle of the night, what are he and his ministry partners doing in the middle of the night? They're singing praise to God. Are they singing praise to God because they like getting beat up? No. Are they singing praise to God because they're in jail? No. They're singing praise to God because God is God all the time. Amen? He is God all the time. And so when you're in the valley, when you're in the pit, when you're in a difficult time, your praise isn't declaring that you're happy for what's happening. Your praise is declaring that you're happy that God is with you while you're going through what's happening. And then when you're on the mountaintop, for some of you right now and throughout this year, throughout 2023, 20, you're going to have times where you're going to gather with us and you're going to be on the mountaintop. You're going to be feeling great. You're feeling healthy. You're strong. Things are going well at work. Your relationships are going well. It's a wonderful time. That's a great time to praise God also. Praise God from the valleys to the mountaintops. Praise God from the pits to the greatest moments of life. And that's what we're going to think about all year long. So here's my invitation to you. Each night of worship, gather with us. Be ready to walk through one of the psalms, the psalms of praise, and be ready to glorify God and praise God, to make a decision to glorify God, even in the hard times and in the good times. And you know that some people would say, well, it's easier to praise God in the valley in the hard times, or it's easier to praise God in the good times. But neither of those statements are true. See, sometimes we forget to praise God in the valley because there's so much pain and struggle, it's just, we just don't think about praising him. It can be hard to praise God in the valleys in the hard times. Praise is a decision. Praise is a choice you will make in your spirit and in your heart. Say, I will glorify God for being God and thank him for being with me and think about his character and who he is even in the hard times. And then you say, well, but it's easy to praise God in, in, in the good times. Have you read the Old Testament? Have you read the history of the people of Israel? You know when they wandered from God the most? When things were going great. When there was smooth sailing. When everything was going really, really well, they forgot who gave them all of those blessings. It's not easier to praise God in the mountaintop or the valley. It's a choice to praise God all the time. And here's the question this year. Will you make a commitment to say all year long, I want to grow as a person of praise? I don't know if you ever kind of have a theme for the year or a goal for the year or a kind of a word for the year or an idea you're going to focus on. But I want to invite you to let, if you've already done that and you have something you're focusing on, that's great. But would you add to it, or if you hadn't thought of something for the year, let this be your theme. Raise a Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God wherever I am, whatever's going on. Because he is with you and he loves you. And in each of the psalms we're going to look at, there's going to be a different theme. And so tonight we're talking about praise, the covenant-keeping God. In one of the psalms of praise, the Psalm 105, which is the psalm that begins with this, this word, hallelujah, a praise, it, it focuses on the theme of covenant. A covenant is a promise that won't be broken, a promise that God makes to us. And in our culture right now, people are not trusting much of anybody or anything anymore. Trust in science, down. Trust in the medical community, down. Trust in politicians, down. Trust in pastors, for a lot of people, down. We, we become less and less trusting. And yet when it comes to God who we worship, we can trust him. He is a God who makes covenants and promises and he always keeps them. So here's my invitation just quietly in your heart right now, you would say, God, this year, I want to grow as a person of praise. I want to grow as a person of worship. I want to raise a hallelujah whatever I'm going through because, God, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You haven't changed. My circumstances might, but, God, you don't change. 
And so as I was thinking about this and, and thinking about, you know, why is it hard for some people to praise? Why, why, you know, is, do you have to learn? Is this something you have to spend years and years learning to actually get to the point where you can praise? And I had something that kind of broke my preconceived notions about what it takes to be a person of praise. Uh, because two and a half years ago, uh, when my, one of my sons, who was a pastor here, Nate, and his wife, Bryn, who was a worship leader here, did you know that all three of my sons, when we moved here, they lived in L.A., Chicago, and Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Sherry and I said, our boys are probably never going to live here. When we moved here, they were all launched, they were all gone, out of the house, none of our boys, and we, kinda, we were like, okay, God's called us here, but our boys will probably never be here. One by one, they visited Shoreline. One by one, they came to Monterey to visit us. One by one, they hung around for a while. And now watch this, some of you don't know this. One by one, all three of my sons, who we thought would probably never come and live here, met young women on the staff of Shoreline Church. All three of them. And married them. And they're all still married to them. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And so uh, that, that, that was a gift we weren't expecting. But our, our firstborn grandson, our firstborn grandchild... They, after they, they moved to Michigan, but when they moved to Michigan, and I'm going to see, where's Cole around here? Is Cole in the, okay, okay. So when they moved to Michigan, so Cohen was 18 months old, and he missed worshiping at Shoreline. He was only 18 months old. So what they would do is when Shoreline would have services online, they would put it online. And, he, and the only person he really had as a worship leader consistently was you, Cole, for the first 18 months of his life, right? And so he's sitting in his high chair, and they have the TV on so he can watch Shoreline's worship service, and it's in the music time. And I want you to see what happens. It's a four-second clip. But I want, you to, I want you to listen closely and watch, this, watch the two side screens. And I want you to see an 18-month-old trying to worship. Watch the screens. Hola, hola. All right. Watch closely again. Watch it again. And listen to what he's saying. Hola, hola. He doesn't even know how to say the word. They didn't plan that. He just, he just started doing that during the music. He started raising his hands saying, Ale ula, ale ula. If an 18-month-old can praise God, can't you? Ah, but I'm nervous. I don't know quite how to do it. And I, and I kind of hold everything inside. So when we sing later in the service, if you want to go, Ale ula, feel free, okay? But, but let, let praise come out of your heart. It's not exactly how you do it. It's who you're worshiping and who you're praising. And so if you've turned to Psalm 105, we're going to walk through the psalm together. I'm going to read it, and it's going to be on the screens as well, but I want you to follow along, and I want you to notice some things. I'm going to give you some things to look for in each part of the passage, and as I read it, I want you just to kind of hone into the scriptures, think about them, and think about these different themes. Here's the first thing. Psalm 105, verses 1 through 5. He is worthy of praise, worthy of your songs, and worthy of all the glory. All right? Follow along. And I want you to notice, in this short passage, in these five verses, there's at least 10. I counted 12 sort of exhortations, challenges from the scriptures for us to enter into giving praise to God. So look with me at verse one. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look how active this is. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face when? Seek his face when? Always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. This is a picture of praise. And I want you to look on the, on the screen. I on the bottom of the top screen. Go to that next, the next slide there. Yeah. These are some pictures of praise from Shoreline Church. Uh, this is Christmas time. We had the, the girls dancing, worship. You know, there, there's different expressions of praise. There's different ways to worship. And, and, and the, the sense of, you know, remembering what he's done, looking to the Lord, seeking him, glorying in his name, giving praise to him, proclaiming him among the nations, wherever you go, proclaiming God. These are all ways to worship. It's public worship. It's private worship. It's corporate worship. It's worship in all different shapes and forms and ways. But my hope and my prayer is that you will become people who will raise an alleluia and praise God and lift him up. Continue on with me in Psalm 105. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 7 now. And I want you to think here about he is the God of covenant. He is the, that's a biblical term for God making a promise, an agreement with his people. He never breaks his promises. He never breaks his covenant. We do at times. But he never does. So notice this as we go on in verse 7. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The promise he made for a thousand generations. If you're into Hebrew parallelism, 
Okay, Hebrew parallelism is how in the, 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 the poetic pieces of the Old Testament in the ancient Hebrew world, uh, they would sometimes put lines together that were sort of saying the same thing in different words. So when it says he remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations, that's saying the same thing. God makes promises, he makes covenant, and he doesn't break them. Okay, a thousand generations, forever and ever, he keeps his word. Verse nine, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac, Abraham's son. He confirmed it to Jacob, Isaac's son, as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. God's promises never end. They go on into eternity. He says, to you I will give the land of Canaan as a portion you will inherit when you were but few in number, few indeed, and strangers in it. They wander from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another. So it's beginning to tell a story. But the picture here is that our God is a God who makes promises, who makes covenants. And when he does that, he does not break them. Now there's times where things get delayed because his people aren't following him. But it's not on God's side. The problem is never on God's side. It's always on our side. And then Psalm 105, verses 14 to 24. He protects his people. He protects his people. And I want to give you kind of three themes we're going to be looking at all through 2023. Here's, here's our three big themes we're going to be looking at. The first, who is this God we praise? What's his character? Because when you know the character of God, you know what you do? You raise a hallelujah. When you really know his character, who he is. So number one, we're going to look at, and, and, and the Psalms give this picture of God's character, who he is. When you know the character of God, you raise a hallelujah. You praise him. Second thing, what has this God of praise done? What has God done? First, who is he? We raise a hallelujah. When you see what he's done, you know what you do? You raise a hallelujah. When you look back in your life and remember all that God has done, how faithful he has been, you praise him, you worship him. So who is this God we praise? What has this God we praise done? And here's the third thing we're gonna look at all through this year. How can we grow as people of praise? We're gonna look at the scriptures and see what it says about how we praise God. Who is he? We praise him. What has he done? We praise him. And then the the scriptures actually teach us how to praise. So each month that we're together, we're going to be learning different ways to praise God out of the scriptures. So so it continues on in verse 14. And now what he starts to do is the psalmist starts to walk through sort of the history of Israel, looking back at their history and their past and key people who led their people and how God was with them and how God guided them. So verse 14, it says, He allowed no one to oppress them. He was their protector. For their sake he rebuked kings. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do not uh, do my prophets no harm. That's God speaking to the nations. He called down famine on the land and destroyed all their supplies of food. And he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. So now it's going back to to when God's people, uh, you know, when the, the... 12 leaders became the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel, sell off their brother Joseph, right? So Joseph goes as a slave to Egypt. And look at verse 18. So it's just telling the story. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons. Till he foretold, till what he foretold came to pass, the dreams he had had that he told his father and his brothers about. Till the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him master of his household, ruler over all he possessed. That's Pharaoh putting Joseph in charge of his household to instruct his princes as he pleased and to teach his elders wisdom. Then Israel entered Egypt. They came there as a place of refuge. Eventually it became a place of bondage, but they came for it to be as a, as a place of refuge. Jacob resigned as a foreigner, resided as a foreigner in the land of Ham. The Lord made his people very fruitful. He made them too numerous for their foes. And so the scriptures begin to look back and say, remember what God did. Remember, remember how God led Joseph ahead of you. And pre- so God is kind of pre-planning to deliver his people. God is moving ahead of them. And then Psalm 105, verses 26 to 38. He delivers his people. Our God is a God of deliverance. And the scriptures say that over and over and over again. And so then we see in verse 26, he sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. And they performed signs among them. And now it, it goes through all the plagues of Egypt. It says, his wonders, in the, uh, his wonders in the land of Ham, he sent darkness and made the land dark, for they had not, for they had not rebelled against, for had they not rebelled against his words, he turned their waters into blood, causing the fish to die. Their land teemed with frogs, which went up into their bedrooms of their rulers. 
He spoke and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. He turned their rain into hail with lightning throughout, the, with lightning throughout their land. He struck down their vines, their fig trees. He shattered the trees of their country. He spoke and the locusts came, grasshoppers without number. You go, this doesn't sound like a lot of fun. It wasn't. This is God's judgment coming on a nation that had put his people in bondage. They ate up every green thing in the land, ate up the produce of their soil. He struck down all the firstborn of their land, the first fruits of all their manhood. He brought out Israel laden with silver and gold. And from among their tribes, no one faltered. Each was glad when they left because the dread of Israel had fallen on them. And so the people of Israel leave Egypt and they leave their bondage praising God. And Miriam leads them in song as they, as they go across the Red Sea and as they're delivered. And then we, we continue on in verses 39 to 45. He spread out a cloud as a covering, as a, as a fire to give light at night. So, so there's this pillar of cloud and this pillar of fire that guides them through the desert. They asked and he brought them quail. He fed them well with the bread of heaven, manna. He opened the rock and out gushed water. It flowed like a river into the desert. For he remembered his holy promise given to his servant Abraham. God provided for his people even in the desert wasteland. And he provided for them for 40 years. Verse 43. He brought out his people with rejoicing, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. He gave them the lands of the nations and they fell heir to what others had toiled for. And the final verse that they might keep his precepts and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. It begins with praise, it ends with praise. And all of life is wrapped into this psalm. All, this, this, is, this is hundreds of years of God's people. And through the highs and the lows, they kept praising God. And so here's the three themes we're gonna look at this year. And we're gonna look at this passage and just take some thoughts. And I want you to just kind of quiet your heart right now and say, which of these is for me? What does God want to say to me? So we praise God because of who he is. So in this, in this psalm, we see who is this God of praise? What's his character? And here's four things. If you're a note taker, write these down. He is a covenant maker and keeper. Our God makes promises, and he keeps them always. As your trust erodes in a lot of the things around you, don't let your trust in God erode. Trust him no matter what. Who is this God we praise? What's his character? He is our protector. Verses 14 to 16 talk about how God, God protects us. And, and if you look in your life, you could go back through your life and say, oh, how God protected me. Oh, how God protected me. From, from your own choices, from other people, from random things. We were in an accident. Our, our car finally got taken to the shop after six weeks because of Christmas and the holidays. And so our car's been sitting in our driveway, smashed up. And uh, we finally got it into the shop. Uh, but we're driving down this road. And this guy just throws a left turn directly in front of us, unannounced, no, I mean, just boom. And Sherry yelled, he's gonna hit us. And we swung out around him. And I thought we got around it. And then all of a sudden, bam, he hit the side of our car. Hit Sherry's side. Airbags went off. Both the doors got smashed up. But we all walked, around, walked away from it. I look forward one day from glory, looking back and God saying, by the way, by the way, there's an angel's hand here. There's something that happened. He caught our eye. He held up his, allowed me to swerve around instead of hitting these people direct on. I think there's hundreds of those experiences in our lives that we won't see till glory. And God will look back and show us all the ways he's protected us. Who is this God we praise? What's his character? He's our leader. You see in this psalm, he led his people through the desert. He, he led them into Egypt to save them from the famine. Then he led them out of Egypt to save them from bondage. But God's leading and leading and leading. How has God led you? When you see him lead you, give him praise. And then the fourth thing that he's done, he has judged with perfect justice. We don't like judgment, but our God is a perfect judge. And he is holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. And his judgments are always true and always good. And then we praise God because of what he has done. All those were things of, of who's God's character, who he is. But here's two things that he did. All right, he provided in miraculous ways. He, he had water come out of a rock, not a natural thing to happen. He brought manna, bread from heaven, that fell on the camp every night, so every morning they could collect bread that they didn't work for, they didn't earn. God just gave it to them. He gave quail who came and landed in their camp so they could have meat. And even when God provided, they complained. And God continued to provide. It's amazing. How has he provided for you? How has he miraculously shown up? when you just couldn't make ends meet and he showed up and took care of you. God does that. 
And then also, what has God, the God of praise done, his great works? He has gone ahead of his people to prepare the way. God is always going ahead of us to prepare the way. You may not see it, you may not recognize it right now in this life. But wherever you're going, whatever you're doing, God will be ahead of you, watching out for you. I think even sometimes when we make dumb mistakes and poor choices, they could have gone a whole lot worse. And what we tend to do as human beings is we tend to, when something goes really well and turns out nicely, we tend to praise ourselves. Aren't I clever? Aren't I smart? Aren't I bright? Aren't I, aren't I a hard worker? Look what I did. And when things go wrong, a lot of people, they start blaming God. Even non-believers, even atheists. Well, but why would God let this happen? Well, I thought you didn't believe in God, right? Even atheists will point their finger at God and try to blame God for things, and they say they don't believe in God. But, but we need to recognize that God is always going ahead of us to, to, to prepare a way for us. And so we look at God's character and we praise him. We look at God's actions and we praise him. But then I just want to pause for a moment and be practical. Three practical thoughts. How can we grow as people of praise? From this passage, first thing, tell and proclaim the stories of what he has done. Over and over, God's people are told, tell the nations, tell the world how good God is. If you're not ready to tell the nations in the world, tell your friends. Your Christian friends, start there. Talk to your Christian Do you know what God did? Do you know how God showed up? Do you know how God provided? Talk, put word, you know, put words to your praise. Celebrate God's goodness and talk about what he's done. And then when you get bold enough, you may be talking with a non-believer and tell them about what God has done. Because see, most non-believers don't believe that God exists. They don't believe that God has power. And if God exists, he started the world. He got out of our way and he has nothing to do with us. But when you say, no, God showed up in my life. God provided here. God protected here. God did this. Non-believers will start thinking, wow, I wonder if that's true. And if it's true, could God do that for me? What's the answer? Yes, he wants to. So tell your stories. An act of worship is telling your stories of God's goodness, praising him before others. All right, that's, that's, that's the first way that we can grow in praise. Here's the second one. How can we grow in praise as a people of praise? Walk in passionate obedience to his word. At the very end of the psalm, verse 45, it says, so know the word. Know the word. Hold on to the word. Follow the word. You know that every time you read this book and live what it says, that's an act of worship. You're, you're offering your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, the Apostle Paul says. So when you follow the word of God, that becomes an action, a lifestyle of worship and praise. And so we tell his stories, and, and we follow his word. And here's the third thing we learn from Psalm 105. How can we grow as a people of praise? Being practical. Sing glory and rejoice in the Lord. Lift up your voice. Sing, praise him. I want to give you an encouragement this year. If your style of worship is such that you go, I don't really like music, I don't really like singing, I don't like praising God. When I read the scriptures, I don't, I don't hear the call to sing and to praise God as an optional thing. I hear it as a call of God for all of us. I'm not really a singer. You know, when I became a Christian, I had no interest in singing. I had no interest. I, that just wasn't my thing. But, but I began to read this book and realize that the God that I had chosen to follow, the God that I had surrendered my life to, is worthy of my praise. So how much I like my voice isn't the issue. How much I like singing is not the main point. The God who is, the God who loves and provides and protects, the God who's worthy of all worship says to us, praise me, sing to me, worship me. So here's my challenge for 2023. And you're here at night of worship, so you, you, you're about this, you're about growing in worship. Take your next step forward as a worshiper. If, if you say, I, I show up to services or I watch online, but I just don't sing. Here's my challenge. Start singing. Start singing. Not for you. For his glory. If you say, I sing, but I'm always guarded. I'm always like, mm, you know, just hold back a little bit. Just let the reins out a little bit, you know. <laughs> just open your mouth a little bit more. Just, just I, I want to I take it to the next level of praising God. If when we gather together corporately for worship, if you're kind of distracted and what you're thinking of is the people around you or what's gonna happen after the service, say, God, say, God, I wanna let that go and I wanna just bring it all to you. I wanna push everything aside and just keep my heart and my mind focused on you. You know, people used to come to church like 15 minutes early to prepare their hearts, to read the scriptures, to pray, to kind of let the, kind of let the, the last week kind of wash away and get ready to glorify God. Maybe that's a step for you. 
Maybe you say, man, I, I love praise and worship. Then you say, okay, then maybe your thing is now I'm gonna start telling stories of God's goodness to other people. I, I mean, when I gather corporately, man, I'm ready to sing. Man, I'm, 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 my knees are gonna bow, my hands are gonna go up, I'm gonna lift up my voice, my heart's there. I love this. If that's you, then say, okay, maybe your challenge is to say, I need to get more into this book and live what it says and have a life of worship that way. Or I need to start talking, telling of his great, wonderful, glorious stories, tell of his goodness, tell of his provision, tell of his protection. But in some way this year, make a decision to take a next step as a worshiper. And so let's quiet our hearts. I'm gonna ask uh, Pastor Keith to come join me for communion. And I wanna ask you just to quiet your heart. And right now, just between you and the living God who loves you, would you just talk to him and say, oh God, I wanna worship you more. I don't wanna hold back. I don't wanna be guarded. God, would you, would you just pray this right now? God, would you show me my next step to a deeper place of worship? And maybe that step is when I'm gathered with your people to really start singing or to sing with passion. If the Holy Spirit's leading you to that right now, would you just talk to God privately and just say, God, I pray that this year, not just at nights of worship, Sunday mornings, but all week long, when there's a chance to praise you, to sing, to worship, I wanna grow in that. Maybe that's your prayer this year, your step forward. For some of you, you've never really told of his wonderful works. You've never declared to the nations what he's done. To talk to other Christians about God's goodness and his, and his glory, that that's an act of worship. When you give praise for what he's done and who he is, other people hear that praise, and so does God. For some of you, that's your next step. For some of you this coming year, your next step as a worshiper is gonna be what, at the very end of this Psalm 105 is, is that you're gonna, you're gonna go into the word more. You're gonna open the scriptures. But you're not just gonna read them. You're gonna live them out. You're gonna say, God, change me, shape me, form me by your word. Let me follow your word and your truth in every aspect of my life. Verse 45, the last verse in Psalm 105 says this, that they might keep his precepts and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. And so with our hearts quiet, we're preparing to come to the table to break the bread, to drink the cup, and to worship as we participate in communion. So if you're at home and you haven't got your elements ready yet, go, go get some kind of juice, go get some kind of cracker or bread, bring it back uh, and sit down. And I really want to, even if you say, well, I'm just going to sit here, I encourage you to get some bread, get some juice, get something and bring it back and get ready to celebrate with us. If you're in the worship center and you didn't get the little worship kind of elements as you came in, just raise your hand right now. We're going to have some folks walk in. I see over here a couple hands. Here's a hand um, right here. And so our team is ready right now and they're walking up right here and over on this side. So just keep your hand up. They'll give you this. And when you get the elements, if you'll just take this, turn it with the wafer up and peel the top off and put that wafer in one hand. So you're kind of holding that and just hold that, that wafer and just begin thinking of the body of Jesus broken for you. Hold that in your hand. We'll partake together in a moment. And then turn that cup over and peel off the other side so you have the juice in one hand. So in one hand, you have the reminder of the blood of Jesus. The other hand, you have the reminder of the broken body of Jesus. And as you hold those elements in your hand, as you think about Jesus, listen to these words from Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse four prophesying about Jesus the Messiah and his sacrificial death, Isaiah writes these words. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him, we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. As you hold those elements in your hand, and maybe even looking at that cup and the picture of the blood of Christ shed, listen to these words. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And in the same chapter... Isaiah writes these words in verses 11 and 12. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death. 
when we come to the table, we come as a remembrance. We remember the sacrifice of Jesus, the price he paid to wash our sins away, to give us new life, to give us hope and meaning and forgiveness. When we come to this table, we remember the call to follow Jesus. As you hold in your hand a reminder of his broken body, a reminder of his shed blood. It was that Jesus who came and said, follow me in every part of your life, including in your praise as you raise a hallelujah. And when we come together in community like this to have communion, we recognize that we are one body. We have a lot of folks online tonight. Whether you're at home alone or with a group of people right now, you're part of the body of Christ. You're part of the family of God. And as we partake of these elements together, it's a declaration of our unity that we stand as forgiven people loved by the living God and forgiven through the grace of Jesus Christ. Remember those things as we prepare to come to the table. And that community does expand beyond Shoreline Church. So if you're here or viewing online and you're part of the greater community, the body of Christ, and you, you belong to a Bible-believing church and you have committed your life to Jesus, we invite you. Join us. This is the table of Jesus, not the table of Shoreline Church. But if you have not yet made that decision, you have not yet called yourself a follower of Jesus because you have not accepted the gift of his death and resurrection for your sins, we invite you to, to watch, to, to see what this is that we do, this, uh, this sacrament that we do to, to be reminded of God's love and the sacrifice of Jesus. And in a moment, we're going to partake of the bread and of the juice together as a sign of our unity together in Jesus. This bread which we break is our communion with the broken body of Jesus Christ. Going to the cross and on the cross, Jesus allowed his body to be broken. He laid his life down. We didn't take it from him. Those guards on that hill didn't take it from him. The religious leaders didn't take it from him. He chose to lay his life down because at any moment he could have said, no more. He chose to go to the cross to let his body be broken for you and for me. So as you partake of this bread, remember the broken body of Jesus and his loving sacrifice for you. Let's partake of the bread together. Jesus was with his disciples at the Last Supper, he took out the wine and he said, uh, this cup is the covenant of my new blood, the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you. We understand as we look at this that this represents Jesus' blood poured out for us. This is a, a big deal. This is a big sacrifice that he gave up himself. He allowed his blood to be poured out so that we might be clean. Like that his blood cleansed us and allowed us to have a new relationship with him. So we invite you, as you partake of this together, to remember the blood of Jesus shed for you and for me. And so Lord Jesus, we raise a hallelujah. We lift up our hearts and our lives in praise to you. God, if, if, if children can praise you, we can praise you, Lord. And so we pray that you will remind us of the price you paid to save us, to cleanse us. Your gracious gift, your amazing sacrifice. And may we raise a hallelujah to you, not just at church, not just tonight but every moment of every day, from the mountaintops to the valleys low, our eyes still fixed on you. There's no better posture for us to be in than one of worship and praise. And so, with that in mind, the worship team is gonna lead us into a time of worship. For some of you, this may be the first time you open your mouth and sing. You're here, your heart's here, but you just haven't entered in. I, I pray you'll take that step. For some of you, 
you're going to turn up the volume a little bit. You're going to sing to heaven, to the glory of God, and for who he is and what he's done. For some of you, it's going to be yielding your life in a fresh new way. But we invite you now to join us as the worship team leads us and raise your praise to the living God. If you're able to stand at home or on campus, please stand and join us as we worship together.